Hello, and welcome to the Radiant Mission Podcast. My name is Rebecca Toomey, and I'm here today with my amazing co-host and sister, Rachel (laughs) Smith-Smith. Hello. (laughs) Still don't know how to (laughs) do introduction. 11 episodes in, and we're making it awkward. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, you sound like you're like um, one of those like wrestler announcers. In a world. Rachel. (laughs) And now... (laughs) <laughs> weighing in at <laughs> no don't do that. do that one oh <laughs> yeah. straight from the land of texas <laughs> rachel <laughs> i think i have a new career ahead of me <laughs> yeah, yeah you could make it <laughs> Well, thank you for, if you're new here, welcome. We are on a mission to encourage and inspire other believers as they navigate through this crazy life and through their relationships with Christ. We have been talking all about birth and last week, Rachel shared Everett's birth story and how she ended up having a fairly uncomplicated scheduled Mm C-section. Today, she is going to be sharing her story about Maverick's birth which went very different from, Mm -hmm. but it was also a scheduled C-section. So we're going to dive into that. I'm excited for you to share more about that. Excited, but also kind of sad, I think in some ways, because there was a lot around what happened that is not the most fun. So again, I guess maybe we should give a little bit of trigger warning. Yeah. I was about to say that. Yeah. That I kind of mentioned that in last week's episode, but the trigger warning that I was really referring to was really more of this birth because I don't think that my birth with Everett was negative, you know, even though it wasn't what I wanted, it wasn't, doesn't mean it was a negative experience. Yeah. And so I think the trigger warning is, um, Rachel and I, we talk about medical things (laughs) And we don't really have filters when it comes to how we talk about and describe and are descriptive. We have are just nothing phases us anymore, but also if you are pregnant right now and you are trying to avoid birth stories that may instill any sort of fear, that also might be a reason for you to not listen to this right now. Mm -hmm. Um, It doesn't mean that it's going to happen to you by any means. If you're listening, that's not what we're trying to say. It's just, at, we talked about this. If you've been listening, then, you know, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. adding negative stories, isn't necessarily a great thing, but the, there is a purpose to why we're sharing this story, right? Ray, it's educational. Absolutely. We want yes. other people to learn from it. So if everybody just avoids hearing these kinds of stories, then they're not going to learn from it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So it's like, everyone should, you know, gauge what they what can. feels right right exactly so yeah. yeah yeah so if it feels right to you stay tuned i mean it's not the worst thing in the world that you could ever hear right it's just we're trying to i think that your yeah. birth story with brooke is <laughs> <laughs> pretty much as bad as it gets so yeah that's true <laughs> brooke's birth story was was worse for sure. So if you made it through Brooke's birth story and you're all the way to this one, then just, yeah, you'll be fine. (laughs) You'll be fine. (laughs) This has become a really long disclaimer. (laughs) I know this is the longest disclaimer ever, but we just want to make sure that we are giving fair warning to people and that no one is like, what, what, what did I get? But I mean, I guess if you're listening to birth stories, you know what you're getting into. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you had a pretty good experience with Everett. You know, you learned that you had a bicornate uterus. Yes. And then the next time that you got pregnant, now I'm assuming you waited a certain amount of time in between. So yeah, I kind of want to take a few minutes to go through the in-between a little bit because mm-hmm. um there's some important things in there that'll kind of lay the groundwork, not just for understanding my pregnancy and birth with Maverick, but also when we get into future topics that we're going to get into like infertility. Okay. So, um, 
to kind of pick up where we left off with Everett, you know, we had the C-section now I'm postpartum. I was diagnosed with at the time uterus didaphis, which is two separate uteruses. Mm -hmm. I'll get into in a few minutes, how that diagnosis actually changed, Mm -hmm. um, to the bicorner uterus, but, Mm -hmm. um, for this point in history, which was 2000, 15, actually it was the end of the year. So we're going to 2016. I'm now postpartum new mom and breastfeeding was incredibly difficult. And I, at what is very typical for most women, especially seeing OB, but it probably is the same with midwifery care too, is at six weeks, you go in for your postpartum checkup. And I think what most of us face with OB is what are you going to do to not get pregnant again? Like (laughs) that's like half the point of the appointment. I thought they asked you that the day the baby's born. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) What are you going to do? And you're like, I'm not going to do anything to get pregnant Uh, because (laughs) I'm like all torn up. Um, so yeah, that my six week, um, appointment, she asked me that, and this was a time in my life before Everett, I had taken birth control pills for almost a decade Mm -hmm. and I had gone off of it and got pregnant with Everett the first try after going off the pill. Mm -hmm. So when she's asking me this at my six week, um, you know, post-op I'm like one, I'm not even on my radar, (laughs) but like, I don't want to think about that. Um, Why are you putting this on me right now? Yes, exactly. But she, she's like, well, if you're not doing something, this is how Irish twins happen. And I'm like, okay. And so she said that there's good options for birth control pills. What does she post- got against Irish twins? That's what I want to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know how they are too about once you, uh, once you had a C-section. C-section. Yeah, yeah. They make a big deal that I like, know. you're going to die if you get pregnant again soon. Yeah. You're that's um, it. right. Yeah. So <laughs> I was concerned because I was already struggling with breastfeeding. Well, is taking a hormonal birth control going to affect breastfeeding? And she said, it usually doesn't. Oh, I know. <laughs> Dramatic pause. <laughs> Cause it that's a lie. I'm just going to be at least up. Usually. I mean, most OBs would be like, no, it's fine. Yeah. I, the, it's not true. Them saying that, like, I don't know why they say it. I mean, maybe they're not intentionally lying. It's, um, it's just not true. I mean, your hormones play a huge role in, production of breast milk. So if you're fiddling your around with life, them, it, yes, everything yeah. about your body. So I didn't know this of course. And so she said a low dose, uh, birth control pill shouldn't cause an issue. So she put me on that and I have been trying to remember how long I took it for. And I can't, honestly, this time of my life is a little bit of a blur, you know, postpartum. And I was barely sleeping because he woke up yeah. every hour on the hour to nurse. Uh, cause he could barely get anything, but I want to say it was for at least six months because mm. of what led me to what is a very significant educational point in my life. Okay. Is I was on it long enough that I got to the point that something tipped me off that I did not feel right mm-hmm. hormonally. And I mm-hmm. think, especially it's very confusing as a first time mom, is you don't know what is postpartum and what is, you know, you have mm-hmm. a totally new body in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. And so I want to say it was being in a online community of moms and someone mentioning that hormonal birth control was affecting 
their breastfeeding. And then I researched it. It was something tipped me off that caused me to research it. Okay. And once I did, I was very troubled with what I found, but it also made me realize the other things that it was affecting in my life. And mainly, um, it was, I think it played a role in my postpartum anxiety, Mm -hmm. you know, which is a form of postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. And also I was feeling very frustrated that I had lower than low in the dumps libido. Mm -hmm. And I was far enough out from giving birth that it was like, is this just how it is as a mother that like, I just have no libido. And when I read about being on the pill and that that is a side effect, then I started to really like evaluate, is this affecting me and my life Mm. in more ways? Mm -hmm. And what's crazy is I was on this for 10 years and never had these thoughts or realizations. Yeah. So it's it's crazy how it takes a moment, right? We are on these medications for a long time and we don't really see it for what it is or we don't see how it's impacting us because I had that same experience, right? I felt the same way where I was on all these things and I knew that they were impacting me, but I didn't take it seriously until I knew, I knew what it was. It's like, I knew it wasn't right anymore. And I I think we talked about this in a previous episode. I don't, I don't remember spacing out, but when I had uh, Marina, the IUD, Right. And it caused me to have suicidal thoughts. And I'd never in my entire life ever had anything happen like that before. And it wasn't serious. It was, well, I mean, suicidal thoughts are serious, but it was more like fantasizing about how I would take myself out. And I think I told you this, that I used to think about going to the cliffs of more and renting a dirt bike and just like dirt bike right off the edge. And I would think about, and I'm like, why am I thinking about that? That's crazy. Mm. And and that's the moment that it all clicked. And I was like, I got to go get this thing out. This thing is jacked up. This is not good. Yeah. Yeah. You had that moment of wait a second. And that led you into researching. Right. And it really, yes, it really took being in this postpartum experience. And I think my struggles with breastfeeding were kind of part of that catalyst. So when I started researching that, this is what, this is what you face when you start researching any pharmaceutical Mm -hmm. is you kind of reach this point of then what do I do without it? How do I live? Mm -hmm. How will I not get pregnant again? Because I definitely, not only didn't want to get pregnant at that point in time because of the C-section, but I was really struggling as a mother as well. Sure. You have a new baby. It's not like you're looking to stack more babies on that pile. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So, yeah. So I am sure it had to have been from one of these online mom groups, but I can't remember exactly what the source was, but somebody introduced me to the book taking charge of your fertility. Mm -hmm. And we are going to talk about this a little bit more, but I'm just going to kind of briefly summarize my introduction and experience with, and how I learned about it then is someone mentioned it as a form of natural birth control. And so I started researching it and I went and I rented the book from the library, which is funny because (laughs) I never rent books from the library. I still don't, but I went and rented it from the library and I started reading it. And I was like, I could do this. Like it made a lot of sense for me. It, it really, I've said this before and I'll say it a thousand times. It changed my life reading that book. Yeah. It opened my eyes to things that. I'm like, how did I never know that this is how the female body works? It's crazy, right? You you told me about this book, Taking Charge of Your Fertility, when I was having a hard time. Actually, it was post Mirena, and then they replaced it with uh, the copper IUD. And I'm like, I can't do this anymore. And you said, you need to read this book. 
Yeah. And I learned about fertility awareness method or fam because of you. Yeah. To this day though, I still am terrible at reading charts and I still text them to you <laughs> to read for me. There is a part of it that hasn't clicked in my mind. I don't know why, but it, so, I yeah, feel so, the same way as you though. It, it taught yeah. me about the female body. I'm like, why are people not reading this when they're 14 years old? Right. Or yes. 13. Yeah. So to give a very brief explanation of it, fertility awareness method and the book, taking charge of your fertility. Although there are other books that I've heard are really great too. The, the, the mentality is to, there are signs that a woman's body has on whether or not she's fertile. And these include your basal body temperature, which means you're waking temperature in the morning before you get out of bed or do anything, your cervical fluid and your height of your cervix because your cervix rises and right. drops as you're cycling through. Right. So your cervix is low when you're ovulating, correct? Your I cervix. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a low, which makes sense because it would, it's low and more open. It's low and open to allow for your, yeah. the seeds to get in there. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so, so yeah, it's essentially educating you on that. Your cervical fluid becomes more what is called egg white or a very noticeable and specific consistency as you get closer to ovulation and then your basal body temperature this is what's so amazing about how God made our bodies is when you release an egg after about 72 hours, the woman's body temperature increases to help essentially the way I think of it, this might not be the scientific term is incubate the egg essentially mm -hmm. that if that yeah. egg is fertilized, that your body temperature rises so that it can implant and grow in a baby. Mm -hmm. So the, the mentality behind it is that a woman's, our entire existence as women is we go through a three stage cycle every single month. And every woman's cycle is a different length. 28 days is kind of the average consensus that they go on, but some women are longer some women are shorter. And so you have your first phase, which is your menstruation. And then you and have, so to, to just start here, the first day of your menstruation cycle is day one of your cycle. Of your correct. Cycle. Yes. Correct. Yes. So you have your menstruation cycle. And then as soon as you stop bleeding, your body is kicking up different hormones doing its thing because it's preparing your body to release an egg in the ovulatory stage. And then it's doing this whole beautiful symphony of, of processes that we have very clear signs for, which is the cervical fluid and the cervix that it's going to release an egg. And then once the egg releases, you can confirm that you ovulated in your past ovulation when your body temperature is sustained for three days. And then you're in the luteal phase, which is your uterus, either it's going to be implanted with a fertilized egg, or if it's not, then it's preparing to shut out and start a new cycle. So this is kind of the very short summary of this method of fertility awareness that is explained in far greater detail in this book. And what is so significant is it teaches you that you are only fertile for about six days out of your cycle. Mm -hmm. And you can read all of the signs very with high accuracy. And you can use this method as a form of birth control by avoiding or using secondary protection during your fertile window. Mm -hmm. So the reason that I wanted to kind of lay the groundwork for this is I learned this in this time mm -hmm. between my children mm -hmm. and it gave me the confidence as I remember going to my husband, Chris, the first time and saying, I want to go off the pill and this and this and this are the reason why. 
-hmm. And he was apprehensive of like, well, we don't want to get pregnant again. Like, what are you going to do? And I said, I've been researching and studying this, and this is what I'm going to do. And he was definitely apprehensive, but I am a researcher and that's part of my (laughs) personality trait of mine. So yeah, I, I also got into really great community. The Facebook community around fertility awareness is so highly educated. I probably learned even more from them than reading the book. Mm -hmm. And that's how I really learned how to read charts. That's what you were mentioning before is chart charting is where you chart all of these signs and it can kind of look like a scientific graph, but these days we have apps that can do it for you. Exactly. They steal all of your data and sell it. So just be aware. (laughs) Just be aware if you don't want your data out there and them to know about your fertility, then you can right. chart your manually on a piece of paper. Right. That's what women did and for that's a long what time women have been apps. doing for this method that has been a around decades. For, yes, a very long time. I'm pretty sure this book was written in like the 80s or you something. You know what's so. been around even longer than this book and these charts? Our bodies. Yeah. <laughs> Because this is God's design. And I think that's what's so amazing about it is that he created our bodies this way on purpose. Right. And I do think that there is a great deception that's going on in the scientific community, namely the pharmaceutical pharmacia community surrounding quote, birth control, control of fertility, where God already gave us the keys here yeah, to understanding how fertility works, but all of us are. So we don't, I, I didn't learn this until I was in my thirties. Yes. And that's what, that's what I felt like when I learned this too, is how am I learning about this for the first time in my, it was for me, my late twenties and it, it makes What I found, and this is why I'm so passionate about fertility awareness method is I felt for the first time in my life as a woman empowered Mm. that my fertility was in my hands to a certain degree, which we will discuss more. (laughs) But what I mean by that, interesting that you say it like that. Yes. But But what I mean by that is. I don't have to deal with the slew of negative side effects, side effects of a chemical pill Mm -hmm. to not get pregnant. I can have a active role and responsibility in my, and also the male partner too, Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. they have to have a level of responsibility too. So anyways, we could probably do an entire episode on fertility awareness. Yeah, maybe, maybe we should. I want to yeah. ask you, um, I, cause I, I think I know the answer to this already, but it's interesting when men learn about fertility awareness and how it works. And then they know when the cycle is expected. And then they also know when ovulation is expected. Yeah. Was Chris also tracking you? Oh, he can now just track me in his mind. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, what is it? Five years down the road of fertility awareness. So yeah, we now, and this was another very empowering aspect of fertility awareness. And the reason I wanted to bring it up at, in this point of my birth stories is because I originally used it for birth control mm-hmm. and it also made me feel empowered to the extent of, I could tell what part of my cycle I was in because I was so in tune with the signs, Mm -hmm. but it also helped me to understand the mental effects that these hormones have on us. And that's why this is going to play into our conversations in a few weeks on fertility, because this was crucial in me and my later struggles with infertility, because I knew there was something wrong with my hormones because I am so educated on fertility awareness. because you so, came became so in tune which happened right. because you weren't taking anything you were instead listening to the signs of your body learning right. what your body feels during certain points in your cycle you know what phase you were in um and can you share a little bit more about the types of hormones that women have that we go through that rise and fall as we go through that cycle 
Yes. So I'm going to go off my memory right here. Um, although I do, I wish I had it in front of me, but the, the best of my knowledge, what rises with ovulation is estrogen. And then what releases the egg is, and this is actually amazing is your ovary has follicles Mm -hmm. and the follicles are what prepare themselves to pop out. I Uh, hope people are watching on YouTube so they can see your hand motion there. (laughs) My fingers. Yeah. (laughs) So what is amazing about this is your follicles actually grow a new organ every cycle that releases a hormone called luteinizing hormone. Mm. And the luteinizing hormone is what is preparing those follicles to release the egg. And this is, so if anyone who has tried to get pregnant before has taken ovulation strips, like you essentially test your urine with them and they're called LH strips. That's what they're testing for in your urine is the luteinizing hormone. Mm. So I never knew that. Yeah. So it's being released from the follicles in your fallopian tubes. Sorry, I'm not explaining the anatomy correctly because there's the ovary and the fallopian tubes have the follicles. And I'm pretty sure, I mean, I'm not a scientist here. I'm going (laughs) based off my memory of learning about this years ago. So that's a hormone involved. Your estrogen is playing a really big role in that as well. And then once the egg is released, then you're pumping out progesterone and progesterone is what thickens your uterus and prepares your body to have a baby stick. Mm. So that's, that's my amateur explanation of the hormones. That's helpful. (laughs) And each of those hormones in addition to the function that they're serving in the process of making a baby or not a baby, not being made, they can all impact you physically and mentally too. Yes. And I think that's the part that we oftentimes just say I'm hormonal. Right. And there's so much more, so much on a deeper level. I do think though, sometimes it takes us having a problem right? Like some people experience what they'll say is PMS or PMDD. There's different terms that they give it, but there is a physiological, biological, hormonal explanation for it. And a lot of times it can be an imbalance, which we'll, we'll explore that because we're going to talk about health in our next series. And I think you're going to kick that off when we talk about infertility too. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I mentioned this a few minutes ago, but the, what I like in a woman's hormonal cycle too, is this amazingly complex symphony. That's what our hormones are like of the way that they ebb and they flow and they each have their role. And if even one is out of balance, you're gonna, you're going to display symptoms. So you made me laugh because I just imagine, I just imagine the worst part where, when we're like really grumpy and like in the, <laughs> like I was yesterday where I was crying and, <laughs> and the symphony's like, don't, 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 don't. Yes. That's why the it's the best part. analogy in my mind. <laughs> so, so that's, that's a woman's body in that's a nutshell. It. And so, uh, that brings us to 18 months postpartum with Everett. I had been practicing fertility awareness for birth control. So it worked. Yes, it was working just fine. It was at least six months, maybe longer. And then I was at the point where I was ready to have another baby. I wanted my children to be close in age. And so this is the beautiful part about fertility awareness. You just start doing the opposite instead of avoiding during your fertile window, you're then doing what you makes a baby during your fertile window. <laughs> and Don't avoid the six days. That's the yes. opposite. And I got pregnant the very first month that I tried that. And 
we found out we were pregnant with Maverick on Father's Day. It was very early. It was a week before my period was due, which was wild to me. And I have the cycle, the chart, I should say, Mm -hmm. still saved in my phone to this day. Um, And then my pregnancy with Maverick, it was very, very different than my pregnancy with Everett. I was so absurdly sick oh, from yeah. five weeks on. I remember on my way to my first OB appointment at six weeks, throwing up in a bag in the car. <laughs> and it was just like, wild. it was so different. Like, yeah, I was nauseous with Everett, but it wasn't like that. It was intense. And we had moved during those almost two years to a different County. So I had, we're still living in California, but you moved South. Yes. Yeah. So I went to my first appointment with the OB that delivered Everett, but that was over an hour away. And so we were, she agreed, you should find someone closer. So we found someone I, I did research looking for a high risk OB. And now that I know I had some uterus issues, someone who had experience in that. And I, I found someone locally and I started my care with her. She confirmed and well, she, it wasn't that she confirmed. She had suspicions in ultrasounds that I did not have uterus didavis, that I had a bicornate uterus, which instead of two separate uteruses, that means one uterus essentially split into one with a septum going through it. And sometimes mm-hmm. the septum is all the way through. And sometimes it's not it really, sometimes this means your uterus essentially like shaped like a heart. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I have a question. They delivered your baby via C-section the first time. Didn't they look at this uterus or can they not tell what's so, going on? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was very confused about during my pregnancy with Maverick. Cause I'm like, okay, you guys are seeing this on the ultrasound, but my other doctor had her hands in there and the uterus <laughs> out. So wouldn't she be the one that would know better? And I mean, she maybe it's me- just too flat and floppy when it's out. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I didn't see it myself, so I couldn't <laughs> tell you, but I was definitely confused by that too. So that actually does play an important part of, I went into this time that I, because I'm more natural minded, even though I wasn't very educated at the time, I wanted to have a VBAC if I could. And this OB was supportive of me having a VBAC. She said there should not be any issue at all with whatever my uterus shape or condition is that she has delivered many women with uterus didafis and bicornate uteruses, and usually they can labor just fine. And so she was supportive of me having a VBAC if, this is a very big if, I had a head down baby. Yeah. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Dun. <laughs> And let's just fast forward that I did not. So at, I remember at my 23 week ultrasound with him, the ultrasound tech mentioning that he was breached, but, oh, it's so early. There's so much time to move. And I said, no, this is going to be a problem (laughs) just because of what I had gone through years before. So My OB was still like, well, well, let's see what happens. But he never flipped again. He was breached from that point on. Did you do anything with Maverick? Did you do? I did uh, not. Spinning babies or chiropractic care or anything. I I did. On your head. Yeah. (laughs) I did all of those things except for the chiropractic care with Everett. And I think this time I just. But it was later or is that that time? It was later, it later. Was later. Okay. So at this point, I think I had in my mind, I know what a C-section is like. It wasn't that bad. I'm mm-hmm. fine with doing that again. Mm-hmm. I was fine with my outcome with Everett. So if that's what this was going to be, it was what it was going to be. And so I didn't feel like going through all the steps to make the situation differently. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, as we'll talk about in the future, 
I'm a very different person now. And now I have a very different opinion than that. <laughs> but this was the point I was at. And one of the reasons I'm a different person now is because of my birth with Maverick. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, he, um, he was, he was breached from that point on. I was just resigned of, okay, it's, this just going to be another plan C section. And so then I was changing my conversations with my OB of making sure that I could have the C-section I wanted. Mm -hmm. And this is where hindsight 2020, I wish I ran out of that office and never went back because (laughs) I was saying things like, I want, it's very important to me to be the first person to hold my son and have immediate skin to skin. I was given that opportunity with my first birth. Mm -hmm. And she said, no, we don't do that. The hospital does not allow that. And And this is what I feel like is so important for mothers or future mothers to understand their rights and that, and to be educated that I wish I knew then what I know now that I, as the mother have the right to hold my baby or have anything happen to my baby. Mm -hmm. And that if that that early on in that doctor's office, that doctor is not supportive of what I want in my birth plan, then I can fire that doctor and find one who will support that because there are plenty of doctors like I had had one that Mm -hmm. would. And I'm fired. Keep shopping. I can't tell you why I went along with that. I don't know. I I understand it because I was there too, right? I was there with Brooke. You just, you don't know what you don't know. And for you, you found somebody that had experience with your similar condition of having corneate uterus. She'd seen the outcomes. And so you trusted her and you had built that rapport that she understood you. And I think that in that time, you probably, it would have been hard for you to pull back from that, even though you saw these red flags, because you, you in your mind were connected to that, that piece, you know, at least yeah. that's my take from the outside. No, I think, I think you're spot on. I think that is what it, that she was an expert. She had all this experience. I did really like her too. She was very friendly and personable, actually, even in some ways more so than my first. That character. can be so. the worst part yeah. right? because right. I mean, you and I have talked about, there's a doctor in your town now that has a reputation of being the sweetest, nicest doctor ever and will tell you everything to get you in as a patient and then also convince you to get a C-section and then convince you that that was what you wanted and it was okay. Yes. Yeah. So So sometimes that happens and people just have these great personalities that we connect with. Yeah. But I think you're making a great point here, which is mothers have the right to choose and mothers to choose who their provider is, and they have the right to change that provider at any point in time. And listen, if it seems hopeless to you, listeners, yeah. <laughs> it's not, I mean, right. I, I, you, you guys know, you listen to my episode. I had nobody at the end except yeah. for the Lord and savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> he yes. was, he was what we were left with. Um, yeah. and well, that's all you need. It is all you need at the end of the day. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's a great point on the trust relationship we build with our provider, whether that's an OB or a midwife. So at that mm-hmm. point, I also was very much bothered by this differing consensus about my uterus. So I was like, okay, we're looking at a plan C section, can you confirm this about my uterus while you're in there? Like, mm-hmm. I want you scoping out the whole thing and I want all the details of what's happening inside my body. And she was said, okay. So as we got to the end of my pregnancy, we sat down together in her office and she looked through her schedule at when I was, they want to schedule you at 39 weeks because they don't want you to have a chance of going into labor. <laughs> and So she's looking at her schedule when I would be 39 weeks and picked a day. She actually, I remember she gave me between Tuesday or Thursday and it was either February 20th 
or February 22nd. And I'm like, both of those days sound like good birthdays. That's the one cool thing about scheduling a C-section is you kind of get to pick your kid's birthday. And I picked February 20th because the sooner the better in my mind at the time. So that was about a week or so before. And then we proceeded on that day came, I had all my instructions. There's a whole slew of things you have to do to prepare for a surgery like that, to wash your body with some specific soap the day before, um, some antibacterial that probably kills your microbiome. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and we, have to check in to labor and delivery at like six in the morning. My mom or our mom was able to fly into town, you know, a few days in advance. And a, another sweet, not sweet part, but a different part. And, and I guess everybody experiences this, even if you go into labor, but a sweet part of my experience was knowing exactly when I was giving birth is having that kind of last moment with my first son Mm. before I gave birth to my second one. And I remember specifically wanting to do a special thing with just him and I knowing it was never going to be just him and I again and crying about it. And (laughs) every mom who's about to have their second kind of has these moments of what it's going to be like, how am I going to love another baby as much as I love this one? It's, (laughs) it's like you become a mother for a second time. It's yeah, really a beautiful thing. So we check into the hospital on the 20th and early and you're in the um, labor and delivery, like prep room for a mm-hmm. long time, many, many hours. I guess the OR was being held up by someone else or something. And in that time, there's people coming in and they're like making sure I'm not having contractions and stuff, even though I wasn't in labor, but they're, <laughs> they, they would come in so they could scare them out of you just in case yes. you're having them. They're coming in to stick me with things, you know, do the IV, doing all this prep. <laughs> there's people coming in and introducing themselves like the anesthesiologist. Cause you know, there's nothing that'll shut real labor down faster than a bunch of white coats coming in. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So people are coming in and then a doctor, I don't remember anything about her except that she had really bright red lipstick on and like kind of sloppy. <laughs> That's all I was she tell making you out with somebody before she came in. No, or? it was just like, you know, you have to be very careful when you're applying a li- lipstick in red. She didn't use a liner. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I remember about her. I don't remember her name or anything, but this is significant because she came and introduced herself as the attending in my surgery and starts going through blah, 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 blah. And the whole time she's saying whatever she was blah, blah, blahing. <laughs> I'm just thinking, where the heck is my doctor? Like, Who's this lady? <laughs> and then- <laughs> <laughs> and finally I'm like is this lady gonna be in there with my doctor yeah and so I'm just like I'm sorry where's my doctor uh-huh. is she not gonna be here and she's just like oh what do you mean like confused and I'm confused and I'm like my doctor doctor so-and-so and that I've been seeing for the last eight yes. months yeah where is she's gonna be here right because I I haven't seen her yet this morning and she's like oh no she doesn't normally do these I'm like what do you mean she doesn't normally do these what is these (laughs) (laughs) you mean the c-section delivering babies (laughs) and I didn't really say that I just was like what do you mean she she thinks she's gonna be here I did say that (laughs) Cause I'm like, we scheduled this together. She had me on her schedule and she goes, Oh, 
<laughs> well, let me go call over to her office and see what's going on then. And I'm like, yeah, you do that. And then she's gone for 45 minutes. Oh, no. In that time, I am panicking. I'm losing oh, it. I can only imagine. Yeah. And Chris, w- this was the time. I meant to mention this in the interim time between Everett and um, being born and me getting pregnant again, that this was the time of our life. I've shared a little bit about my testimony before that I came back to the Lord. I was born again, baptized. I was baptized literally the month before I got pregnant with Maverick. Mm -hmm. So this was, I was a baby Christian essentially Mm -hmm. at this time, but I was like newly renewed in my faith. Mm -hmm. So that caveat is because I did have a different, even though I was going through the steps very similarly that I did with Everett of just like adhering to the medical system and what people were telling me, I was leaning on the Lord at least to an extent with, with Everett, I really had almost no relationship with God. So Mm -hmm. in this time I'm panicking because I'm like my doctor that I trust. And we talked about all of these details. I also had a, a issue with my scar for my first incision. And I had talked with her in detail about her fixing it and I'm freaking out. And then Chris just prays over me to calm me down. And that really helped. Mm-hmm. And that's why I mentioned how things were different for us from a faith perspective a bit. So the doctor comes back, red lipstick lady comes back <laughs> and She said, so I called over to her office and she's had a personal emergency. So she can't be here today. And that's why you were on my schedule. Is that true? We did confirm. It wasn't, I wouldn't say we confirmed later. We heard a pretty, it seemed like reliable rumor later that she was having some major heart issues. Oh, she was an older woman. I was wondering if it was true that she really, um, just didn't really deliver babies, I guess was what I was. No, I don't know why. I don't know what that lady was talking about with that. I, I, here's, here's the theory that I formed based on all the information coming together. This is what I learned later that I did not know at this moment in time of the story. This was at a teaching hospital. Mm -hmm. They do things a certain way. She was a teaching surgeon and Mm -hmm. she had me on her schedule for that day with an army of residents Mm -hmm. and med students. Let's just all picture right now, Grey's Anatomy, because that's the situation that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. I was one of the scheduled lessons for that day on Grey's Anatomy. The scheduled what? Lessons. Lessons. (laughs) And so... I think that's probably what she meant by she doesn't normally do these because I think things would have been differently if my doctor was there because she maybe wasn't the same educator type of, Oh, you know, I never thought about that. Yeah. They were using you as a, as a, as a little test dummy lesson there. Hey, I think they saw. This lady My, has a bicornea uterus. Let's get actually yes. bicornea uteruses and uh, Di Davis have been on Grey's Anatomy before. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what's really not that lot. Grey's Anatomy is anything like real medical environments. Right. But what's ironic about, and this is why I think you and I've been kind of careful about warning people who are pregnant of listening to you know, traumatic birth stories is I was going into this birth with a very, like, for some reason, even though I was, you know, had faith in the Lord and that he would carry me through, I had this like really intense fear that I was going to die in this surgery. Mm. I was irrational, Mm. but I was, and I kept, I had thought about multiple times Grey's Anatomy because I had watched that show like a year or so before. And I I kept 
that kept coming to my mind. But so here's what's really significant about this point that we're at with this attending, introducing herself, is that neither she nor the hospital admin who came in and had me type in my name on an iPad signing consent forms, nobody ever verbally asked my consent if I was okay with residents and med students being in my birth. No mm. one ever asked me that or told me that. Nobody ever said anything about it. Mm -hmm. It, I'm assuming, was in those forms that I signed mm -hmm. and I didn't read. They just fold them in there. Yeah, because there's literally hundreds that you're signing. I had signed a bunch in the office with my doctor the week before. Yeah. So when the, this lady is saying this to me in this moment, I'm like, okay, the, I guess this is it then. Like, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. Leave, you know, which I <laughs> totally could have. I wasn't even in labor. <laughs> but it did feel like that. It's like all of the, this train is in motion. Mm -hmm. Like I'm the center focus. Mm -hmm. And so we, you know, Chris prayed over me again and we proceeded. And this is what I hate about C-sections. I think I mentioned this last time, but how they won't let the partner go in the OR when they do the spinal. Is that See, I don't, I didn't have that experience because I had an epidural, epidural with already. Yeah. And he, Mike was there when they did the epidural. Yeah. I really don't get why they can't have the partner in there because they have to scrub up and sanitize anyways. So how is a scrubbed up nurse more appropriate than a supportive partner when they stick something in your spine? I don't um, know. Maybe they and, don't want the partner to like jerk or yeah, something. I yeah, don't know. Yeah. It's, um, I don't know why either. And I didn't think to ask, but <laughs> so I hate that part though, because that's yeah. what I really have anxiety about. And this was very different than the first time that I had it. The first time I had this super compassionate nurse holding me while the anesthesiologist did it this time I had some young woman and I, you can't see anyone's faces because everybody has masks on either. So it's mm -hmm. like, everybody is just a mask. Mm -hmm. And yep. so you know, right now I'm realizing maybe this is why masks gave me so much anxiety when the pandemic started. But... Probably you had PTSD <laughs> from all these mask faces. Yes. So they, um, I'm on the table. They're doing the spinal. It's some, that anesthesiologist guy who had introduced me was standing there at some computer and this woman is prepping me. And I'm just like, already getting overwhelmed like who is she what is she doing and she's like you gotta sit up you gotta bend over and then they're like shoving their fingers in your spine and their fingernails to get in to determine what spine they're gonna go in and she was very intense and I'm like why is this lady touching me who is this lady and then the attending steps over and he's like no you need to do it higher nope not there and he's like oh talking gosh. her through it and I'm like what the heck is happening and this is what's, this is what's important for people to understand about C-sections and things happening in the medical field is as the person who it's happening to you, essentially, I look back on this time and I had to start disassociating essentially mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to save myself from losing it because mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't know who's touching me and who is doing something that is a very significant medical procedure to me right now. Mm -hmm. And I shut down to the point of, I couldn't even ask, mm -hmm. who are you? What are you doing? Like I was just shutting down mm -hmm. and I was so overwhelmed and it's a very overwhelming thing in general that you're in mm -hmm. such a sterile environment. And then it's like, you got to lay down quickly as soon as it's set in and they lay me down and everything is, you know, it happens so fast. And then there's a huge light above me. That was a mirror essentially. And it was right above me. And there are suddenly like 50 people in this OR, so many people 
And I'm like, where did all these people come from? There's so many people. You are now the gallery. Yes. Yeah. And this light is over me and I'm just staring into it because I can literally see my naked body in it Mm. and I'm staring at it. And then they're starting to prep my belly and then they have scalpels in their hand. And I'm literally thinking to myself, am I about to watch them cut into me? And I'm like, I'm like going to lose my mind. Like I am doing that hypno babies breathing that helped me to get through my anxiety with my first C-section, but I'm like really going to the extreme. And then I'm also like, they're about to cut me open and my husband's still not in here. Mm -hmm. So finally I said something to someone fluttering around my head, where's my husband? Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, he should be in here soon. And I'm like, can someone make sure, like, I need my husband. Mm -hmm. And a few minutes later, and they at some point moved to the light. So I could no longer see my self about to be. Oh, good. Yes. But I was resigned that I was going to look away too at that point. So Chris, my husband walks in the OR and the second I see his face, I start crying Mm. and he comes over he's like, what's wrong? Why are you crying? And I'm like, I don't, I couldn't even tell you if I had the words, but I also am like so uncomfortable. Like, let me tell you how there's so all these people around and I don't know who they are and they're touching my body. And like, yeah, it's just, yeah. I didn't have words for it. I was just crying. I was overwhelmed yeah, yeah, and I was disassociating. And at that point, and this is the one part of the procedure that I have any appreciation for is the attending anesthesiologist, which I, always differentiated him because he was a Japanese man and he had an accent. So he came over and he said to Chris, you, um, you don't understand what she's just gone through. This is one of the only surgeries that the person is awake for. And it's very overwhelming what she just went through. And, and he explained it to Chris and I kind of appreciated it because it was Mm -hmm. like, I didn't have the words. He came and said something and then Chris that was was, nice. Yes, it was nice. What I do not appreciate is the other guy. Well, that girl that she was a girl and she was waiting the whole time. Yeah. As soon as he walked away within minutes, I started to lose consciousness. Mm. So what I don't appreciate is I'm pretty sure what he did is he, it was him who did it. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, I thought it was the the other lady. No, is that he walked away from explaining that to Chris after seeing that I was sobbing Mm -hmm. and I was quietly sobbing. It's not like I was screaming Mm -hmm. or being hysterical. I'm just quietly sobbing to myself. And he walked, I think what he walked, he walked away and pushed a sedative in my IV to calm me down Mm -hmm. because within minutes I was, it was like, I was fighting my consciousness to stay awake. Yeah. But remember what I said about the anxieties going into this, that I was having a lot of anxiety for some reason about dying in this delivery. Mm -hmm. So when I start feeling like I can't, I'm losing consciousness in my mind, I'm like, it's happening. I'm dying. And, and I remember just like, looking at Chris and I'm like, I can't stay awake. And he's like, just close your eyes and just take a little nap. I wish I could smack him, but they have have your arms tied down. And I just said, no, I don't want to miss the birth. I don't want to miss the birth. And I fought so hard to stay awake. And it was really hard. And this is one of the reasons that I feel confident. He pushed something in my IV is I never had this feeling in my first It might not have even been a sedative, it could have just been more pain medication and it made you sleepy because pain medication can make you very, very, very sleepy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So one, one aspect, yeah. One aspect going into this birth that I stressed to Chris is I wanted him to film Maverick being born because Mm -hmm. one of the things that really bothered me about my birth with Everett was I didn't get to see the first moments of my son's life. Mm -hmm. Like I was able to hold him 
within a minute or so of him being born but I didn't get to see the moment he entered the world. This is what's really sad about most C-sections. And so I wanted Chris to record it so I could see it later. And so he, when things started coming, you know, he knew the drill now. Mm -hmm. He was filming. And then that female anesthesiologist came over and said, you can't be filming this. You need to put your phone away and like yelled at him. And he was like, oh, okay. But he got enough of it because I do have the video. He got until they were about to pull his head out. And they were like, he said, really yanking on his head. Like he was like, it was actually starting to concern me that because he was breech, it was body out first. And then they're ripping at his head. And that's the point he had to stop recording because she yelled at him. Mm -hmm. And they get him out. He was perfectly healthy and beautiful and fine. I mean, I didn't see it, so I couldn't tell you, but that's what I, I see on the video. Um, or, and Chris did, and they brought him over to the warmer immediately since the hospital policy is not to do skin to skin with the mother who just gave birth and they clean him up. They wrapped him up, probably took five minutes. Then finally, Chris brings him over to me and he you know, I get to see him for the first time. The first thing I said is, oh my gosh, he looks like your dad. <laughs> <laughs> and he was all bundled up. I could only touch his cheek. I didn't get to hold him or anything. And then someone said to Chris, you need to go to recovery now with the baby. And this is another thing that I wish we were informed of or educated on that mm -hmm. he could have known because he just like there were so many things that I didn't know and was overwhelmed about. It was the same for him. I wish he would have said, no, I'm going to stay with my wife, mm -hmm. but he went to the recovery room mm -hmm. and he was able to do skin to skin there with him, which yeah. Know, tell, tell us what happened yes, because of that. we have a joke to this day that Maverick has always been a daddy's boy. He is, he's four and a half now. He loves his daddy. He has actually for the first, when he started saying dad, dad, which is nor a lot of times a baby's first word, he didn't just call Chris dad, dad. He called me dad, dad for like the first year of his life. We were both dad, dad. Like he <laughs> loves his daddy. And I have joked, I still do to this day that the reason is because Chris got to do skin to skin with him. And so he imprinted on Chris because he stole the golden hour from me. <laughs> <laughs> it really was the hospital that did it. Not they, totally. He did. The hospital stole your golden hour and gave it to yes. Chris. How yeah. rude. So he did skin to skin and now Maverick is a daddy's boy. So this is where things are really hard for me is it was much worse after that for me. Cause Chris because Chris is gone. Your baby's gone. You're by yourself. Yes, You're here now, with 50 students. Right. And at this point, People are now just like funneling out of the OR, like just people walking out. And I do remember, I remember the attending leaving. She came over to me because when I was in the prep, the prep room, when she had said, I'm, um, you know, your doctor's not going to be here. I'm going to do this. I'm like, okay, well, I had asked my doctor to confirm if I have uterus didathis or bicornuate, like, can you make sure you inspect that? And so you can tell me. And I also wanted this issue fixed with my scar. And so that I had asked her before the surgery and the five minutes I had to get to know her. Mm -hmm. And so as she was walking out, she's like, congratulations. Oh, by the way, it is a bicornuate uterus. And um, that's it. Like, that's the amount of information I get. And then she left. And I remember thinking, if she's leaving right now, and there's still things, they're still putting me back together on the other side of this um, paper, you know, curtain, mm -hmm. then who's doing that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because yeah, yeah. like I said, I did not know about the residents and med students thing. Nobody had told me that. So I'm just like, what is happening? Like, who's putting me back together if this lady just left? And mm -hmm. like other people were leaving too. There was, 
And so then at this point, You're I'm no longer, <laughs> yeah, I'm no longer at that point. I'm like, I should just go to sleep now. I should take a little nap now. But now I have adrenaline because I just met mm-hmm. my baby and I mm-hmm. just want to go see my baby. And I just like want this to hurry up and be done so I can get to the recovery room and be with my baby. Mm-hmm. And um, a they were playing. All I remember is the energy in there like changed, but maybe it was just because I started noticing it. Katy Perry music was playing. I don't, that's, I just remember that. That detail. sounds like a nightmare. Yeah. It was kind of like a, almost like a party atmosphere type of thing going on behind that curtain. <laughs> and then, and then I hear, um, I hear a female voice say to a male voice, have you ever sewn skin before? Mm. And then he said, I, yeah, a few times. And she said, I'll walk you through it. And then I proceeded for like, I don't even know how long, but some length of time to listen to someone else explain and show and teach another person how to sew my body up while I could feel it. Because that's the thing about C-sections. You feel everything. You just don't feel the pain. You can feel the tugging and the pulling and, and at that point, I would like, is this really happening to me right now? Like I, I, I even was like, should I tell them that I can hear them? Like, it yeah, was just so yeah. weird. To it's me. so surreal. Yeah. And I didn't have, you know, I mentioned in my C-section with story with Everett that I had my best friend, Lindsay in there mm-hmm. with me mm-hmm. for that one. This hospital would not allow two people in the OR. So Mm -hmm. I didn't have a second person. Mm -hmm. It was Chris and he was gone with the baby. And this is why that second person in the OR is so important. This is why a doula can help even in a situation with a C-section too. Yes, absolutely. This is a huge reason to have a doula, even with a C-section that I did not have in this moment. And, and so I was just, this is a, a, just a continuation of that disassociating of what I, I'll get to that in a second, but anyway, so I am just like, is this really happening to me? And then they finish up and then I, one of them walks out and says, congratulations. And they walk out and I'm like, who is, the, who are these people? <laughs> And I later found out that that was the person who actually delivered the baby was a resident. Mm -hmm. And then all that's left in the OR are me and two nurses. And they were arguing about not being able to find all the sponges. One of them was yelling at another one. And I'm just like, can I leave for this? Like I'm already sewn back up and nobody else is in here. And I'm very antsy to get to my baby. Uh, yeah. And I finally that nurse was grumpy and yelling at the other one and starts pushing me out of the OR. And then right on the other side of the OR is the recovery room. Well, not even a Did room. they recover all the sponges. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think so. No, I think they did say, oh yeah, I got them all here. I don't remember what she said, but it's, you know, to be- that happens. Um, that, Grey's happened Anatomy. To some, that happened to somebody that I know. <laughs> really? Yes. Yeah. This is what's messed up about surgery. And then they had yet. to go back in because they got an infection. Yeah. They, something exactly. got left behind. This has happened multiple times on Grey's Anatomy. So <laughs> <laughs> Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> So talk about programming though. Grey's Anatomy is like I one know. of the biggest programming yeah. TV shows that exists. Yeah. So I get to the recovery room um, and Maverick is laying in the bassinet in a diaper and I'm like transferred into the bed and, or I wasn't transferred. It was, my bed was pushed into where the hospital bed's supposed to be. And everyone's like bustling around. And I'm like, is someone going to hand me my baby? Cause it's like, you know, you just came out of surgery. You're not exactly jumping up to grab them yourself. Yeah. And then Chris or one of the nurses is like, oh yeah. And then they hand him to me. And I was finally after 
this was Chris said it was over an hour and a half that they took to put me back together. Which oh, wow. That's a long starting, time. Yes. He said he was starting to get worried because of how long it was taking. Cause he knew how long it took the first time and it was mm-hmm. taking much longer and he was really getting worried. Mm-hmm. And, um, at that point I was able to nurse Maverick and he nursed right away. And, um, you know, and then we had our beautiful, you know, special moments that we all do is even if you go through the most traumatic of C-section births, like you did, you still, once you have your baby, like everything is perfect. Everything yeah. is everything right. with your baby is perfect first. <laughs> that's for sure. Yes. Yeah. But everything no? is right in the world Yeah. for those moments when you're finally able to get that, um, what is the hormone when you get to hold your baby endorphins yeah yeah or... and the the love hormone oh oxytocin oxytocin yes you finally start because like when you're laying on a cold table with people yeah. talking about your skin they're sewing like <laughs> a horror movie the oxytocin wasn't flowing so much then so yeah so in recovery um and once we got to our room i asked chris i was like did that red lipstick lady, the attending who introduced herself, did she, is she the one who delivered Maverick? And he's like, no, she never touched your body. It was two <sighs> residents who did the whole thing. Two female residents. Those must have been the two people who like, when they were walking out, were like, congratulations. And <clears throat> so that really bothered me. Because I'm like, I didn't even know the faces of the people who delivered my son. And, you know. Yeah, you wouldn't know them on the, if you ran into them at the grocery store, you'd have no idea that those are the people that pulled your baby out of your body. Right. Yeah. So I very soon started struggling with processing this birth. Mm. And I think it was, it took a very long time, honestly, years because some of those feelings that I was trying to describe of the disassociating and feeling overwhelmed and feeling like this surreal and is this, this really happening? It, it kind of breaks your brain in a way because I've heard someone explain surgery before, and this is going to sound really dramatic, but it's honestly very accurate. I once heard someone explain that any surgery that happens to a person is a, the body is handling it as a trauma. It is a oh, trauma absolutely. both to you physically, but also to your brain. Mm-hmm. And it is similar to how the body were to process the trauma of rape mm-hmm. because you are unconscious men most of the times or paralyzed. Mm-hmm. You are not in control of your body. You are not giving consent to the hands on your body. Mm-hmm. You're not giving consent to what is done to your body. And there's the physical trauma of a, you know, surgery that happens there. Mm-hmm. And when I heard someone explain that, which was about a year ago, it really put it into perspective of understanding what I was mentally going through in the moment of Mm -hmm. why I had to disassociate and not knowing how to kind of like process those emotions is that level of consent and lack of bodily autonomy. And I just remember crying and crying about this birth for the months after, because the way that I explained it at the time is I felt like a lab rat on a table. Mm. And once I started to put pieces together and understand, oh, those, that was the resident that was teaching the med student how to sew me together. And that was this and that. And once I started to put it all together and I realized that I was just their lesson for the day Mm. and I wasn't a human on the other side of that curtain to them. Mm -hmm. And that to me is very disturbing that future doctors Oh, I mean, residents are technically doctors, but, you know, future practicing OBGYNs are, this is the bedside manner that they're being trained in. Mm-hmm. And that that's messed up to me mm-hmm. that instead of me being a human woman and mother who is giving birth to her child, 
I was a, I was their medical lesson. It was like you were an object. Yes. You know, yes. because they didn't come in, introduce themselves, show their faces to you, anything like that. They just came in, did this technical medical process procedure, and then left. Exactly. It was a transaction. Yes, exactly. Which, and that- oh, I, I think some people will think, well, doctors and nurses and people in medical professions, they have to learn somehow. But the point that you're trying to make is that people need to make the choice to be the ones that they are learned on. Just right. like people decide whether or not they want to be an organ donor, mm-hmm. you should be deciding whether or not you want someone sewing your skin for the first or third time that they've ever sewed skin. Yeah, absolutely. That to me is the definition of informed consent. And yes. that's why I have and, a hard and time. Reading some hundred page waiver is not the it's appropriate not way to make that decision. Yes. And I have my own, I guess you could call it conspiracy theories that I think they had my record on their docket and they were like, oh, this is a great, you know, uh, most residents maybe won't get to see this in their, you know, before they become a doctor. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that they purposely do not they purposely toe the line of legality of not fully informing the mother so that they can be in this situation because their priority is the education of their residents and their med students. Because I will tell you this, if at any point, like what should have happened the week before in my doctor's office, that she at told me that residents and med students would be in there and ask for my informed consent, I would have said no. Mm. And that is my right because it's my body and my baby. Mm-hmm. I would have said no. And then they wouldn't have gotten that, you know, got that opportunity, mm-hmm. but I would have had a way better experience. I could tell you that. And I had a few friends giving birth at that hospital months after me. And I was the one who was able to tell them, you need to tell them that you do not consent to residents and med students being in your birth if you don't want them there. And I had a really good friend who delivered there a few months later, and she was able to say that. And she had a good experience at that hospital. She didn't have a C-section. She had a vaginal delivery, but because I informed her, yeah, yeah, she was able to you know, so that, that, that's, this is what is so disturbing about teaching hospitals to me is I think that they take advantage of mothers, especially, you know, high risk, quote unquote mothers who, and and I'm not saying I wasn't high risk according to them, I am high risk, but someone who has a more complicated situation, you know, like you said, some, they have to learn on somebody, but here's the other thing. If they have to learn on somebody, then it should still be full consent. And I yeah, think many, it should be somebody who wants, yes, somebody who learned wants, on it and then it's going to go better for everybody. Right. And, and if they know that, like so, plenty of women would choose that, but here's the other thing is there should be some kind of financial compensation or hmm. discount or something <laughs> that would incentivize. Oh yeah. If I'm going to have, you know, X amount of dollars for allowing your classroom to be in my birth today, then that is absolutely how it should be. Because instead I saw the bill months later that my insurance was billed $78,000 this surgery cost. Well, that's what I was going to say. Of course, they're not going to do that because they're going to bill insurance and they want their insurance money. So they're getting paid by the medical students who come out of college with $250,000 in debt and they're getting paid or maybe more. I don't, I don't know. And then they're also getting paid by these insurance companies. If, so if that scenario were true, by the way, 
or the idea yeah. where you get a discount if you let your, you know, the lab cu- customer yeah, and you got a discount, then they would just raise the cost for yes. all of the other patients. <laughs> That's yeah. how it would end up That's working true. out. But what I found so interesting about that is my first birth at a non-teaching hospital that was a scheduled C-section and a way better experience. I remember seeing the bill from that one. It was like $50,000. So this was significantly more money oh, wow. at this teaching hospital. And, and to me, that's just complete BS. Like it just pisses me off. So <laughs> yeah, it, um, <laughs> it's, um, after that, I really expressed to, to Chris for a lot initially how much, I was bothered by all this, how upset I was. And he didn't know the proper way to respond, but he was just like, you know, you're healthy. The baby's healthy. Like, what are you upset about? Like, what do you need to worry about? And that's the (sighs) language that often men can have, which I'd really love for men to not do that. It's essentially gaslighting, (laughs) right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, mean, it it is, it's a hundred percent gaslighting. It's exactly what my OB did, said to me too, well, yes. what are you crying about? At least your baby is healthy. I think I'm learning every day how many wrong things that we say. And I've fallen into this too, where we say things when somebody is pregnant. We say things when someone has one child. Oh, aren't you, aren't you, when are you going to have more? Yeah. Or if someone has no children, are you going to have kids or there's all these scenarios where we have all these weird things that we say to people that are not the right things to say to people. Yes. (laughs) And this is one of them. Yeah. And that's a woman has birth trauma. Never say to her, at least you have a healthy baby because that's not helping anything. Right. Exactly. And, and you know, it's not to speak ill of Chris because he's a wonderful husband. He's sure. He doesn't, he didn't know what to say. Yeah. Like you just said, there's certain events that happen in people's lives. And, and as a society, we often don't know what the appropriate thing to say is. And Mm -hmm. so that is, you know, just to give a tip, the appropriate thing to say is to validate the mother's feelings. I am so sorry that that happened to you Mm -hmm. and that you're feeling that way how can I support you? That that's, if you don't know what to say, that to me is the best thing to say Mm -hmm. is asking. And, and we, because the thing is, is we don't know, like we're processing it. And Mm -hmm. this is what I, why I hurt for you so much when you went through your birth with, with Brooke. And I talked to you like right after you, you know, got out of recovery and, you know, were a wreck is I knew that you were going to be on this same, you joined this birth trauma club in Mm. a moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it, and my heart broke for you because it is a hard and lonely place to be because you don't know how to navigate. You know, you're so happy to have your baby. Like, you know, more than anyone, like, thank God I have a healthy baby and that I am alive but you still have to navigate this trauma Mm -hmm. mentally. It's, Mm -hmm. and it, and it's very hard when something is, it's similar when someone is, you know, struggling with depression is it's, you can't control your thoughts and emotions about a situation, especially, you know, when it's something that, that, you know, is very trauma traumatic. So it's a battlefield. I I think he might've even said that to me at some point. I don't know. It, it's a, it's impossible to explain how to navigate it. Everybody's going to process it in a different way and at a different time. Yeah. I think it was harder for me in the beginning, mostly because I had a catheter Yeah, and I was pretty mad because I did, I wasn't told the truth. And then, you know, that nurse helped me out, but then it cycles around. Right. I mean, there was, right. I cycled through that for a long time. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't understand the power 
behind, you know, you hear people talk about redemptive birth. I think Mike Mm -hmm. uses that term a lot, redemptive birth. And I heard people talk about that in VBAC success communities and things like that. And it's interesting that that for me was one of the biggest healing factors Yeah, was knowing it was almost like it just validated the fact that I wasn't broken. Right. And it's not to say that that's the only way to heal though, mm-hmm. because I think one of the biggest lessons in healing was in forgiveness, which yeah. you helped me with that a lot too, that you were like, you need to talk to somebody because if you continue to live with bitterness or anger towards this surgeon, you know, that's not good. Yeah. You know, that's not going to help you. And I think it was, you know, I couldn't have necessarily predicted the outcome. I knew that the Lord was going to get me through. So in a way I can, could predict the outcome, but like, let's say things didn't go as perfectly. I think I was still washed in that forgiveness, which was enough. Yeah. And I think that's part of the thing about trauma is because some people never get that chance, right? Mm -hmm. You might have birth trauma and it's your last baby. It's, you know, you're not going to have more kids anymore, or there's a million scenarios. Um, there's a woman who posts about birth trauma, who she ended up in a surgery and they gave her full hysterectomy. So she'll never have children again. And so there's not that opportunity. So I don't want to make it out to be like, that's the way to fix birth trauma is to have another birth. Yeah. Yeah. The way that we fix birth trauma is by processing it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, it, it took me honestly till probably about a year ago. So Mm -hmm. it took me like three years. Yeah. Over three years. I believe it because Brooke, I mean, she was two years old and yeah, that was when I finally pretty much got to that final point. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I, I did want us to take a few minutes to just talk up a little bit about, some educational aspects that we have both learned in hindsight, mm-hmm. hindsight, mm-hmm. Um, both about breach, birth, and VBACs. Okay. Because this is something, you know, you and I have talked a lot about. Yes. Since having Maverick and having this second breach experience, part of processing this trauma for me was I I think having a traumatic second C-section, I was like, for a long time, I didn't want to get pregnant again because I was, I was, I wasn't processing this trauma and I was scared of going mm-hmm. through this again. Mm-hmm. And then part of the cycling through and the processing was, what am I going to do when I have another child? Because I've always known that I've wanted more children. And I, like I said at the beginning of this, am a researcher, so I'm going to educate myself as what I'm going to do. And I definitely wish I would have done this before I had Maverick, but you know, can't change the past. So yeah, you don't know what you don't, you don't know what you don't know until you know it. Right. <laughs> yeah. And like I said, I was kind of going into it. Okay. With a scheduled C-section because I had a good first time. So mm-hmm. now I, you know, I'm eyes wide open. I've experienced different things and so, um, one thing I, I, I really wanted to just take a second to mention is the statistics of breach. It is not common. It is common for me mm-hmm. because of my uterus shape, mm-hmm. um, a bicornar uterus is, I'm pretty sure it's about 2% of women who have you know, something like what I have, whether it's uterus didathis or bicornate uterus. Mm -hmm. So it's not something a lot of women face, but, um, sometimes women are dealing with breach, you know, with a typical uterus at the end of their pregnancy and, 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 you know, they might be also boxed into a C-section like I was. Mm -hmm. And so, 
I wanted to just say a resource that I have been using to learn a lot from, they have a ton of materials on their website. It's called Breach Without Borders. Mm. They're essentially an organization that their goal is to educate midwives and doctors on the safety of delivering breach vaginally. Mm -hmm. And that the reason that the, the studies done on breach vaginal delivery from the past are very imperfect studies. They have a lot of holes in them. And that's what current medical literature is basing off why it has to be automatic C-section. So how medical schools have shifted is instead of any education at all on how to safely deliver a breech baby vaginally, they are only educating med students on surgery on cesareans, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that that is the automatic case for this because that is the safest option, quote unquote, in their opinion. Mm-hmm. Now, this is what's really pertinent about a lot of research that organizations like Breach Without Borders are doing is they compare the risks of cesareans to the risk of vaginally delivering a breech birth. And so I'm just going to read really quick to, I highly encourage anyone to research this themselves if yes. they're interested at all. Yeah. Especially, I really think as mothers who, you know, if a, a vaginal natural birth is important to you or avoiding a surgery like this, that is, you know, possibly very damaging. I encourage you to research on your own. Like, don't just like take our perspectives as, you know, as, you know, the end all be all here, but I just wanted to read for a second, one of these studies um, from the Breach Without Borders website. Um, this study discusses the effects of the increase in planned cesarean since term breach trial. The results show a risk trade-off between 2001 and 2005, 8,500 women in the Netherlands had planned cesarean for breach. This increase in planned cesarean saved an estimated 19 babies, but it also led to four direct maternal deaths, nine additional babies dying in future pregnancies due to the uterine scar and 140 additional life-threatening maternal complication in future pregnancies. Um, it goes on to quote more research that one baby was saved for every 104 C-sections. However, that number was only true in the short term. A long-term follow-up study found that there was no difference in rates of death or neurodevelopment delay at two years of age. In other words, routine cesarean section for term breach had no long-term advantages. So I just wanted to take a snippet to give a perspective about breach education that what they're quoting this study, you know, in the Netherlands, one of the reasons is pertinent that's another country is not every country handles this the same as America does. Mm -hmm. There are many countries that are still training their doctors and especially midwives on how to safely deliver a breach. Mm -hmm. And from my research that I've done, what is important for a vaginal breach delivery is the education of the provider Mm -hmm. that if someone doesn't know what they're doing, it can be very dangerous for the baby. Yeah. And if someone does know what they're doing, the risk is very minimal. It's not much more than a other variation of a natural birth. Yeah. A better outcome. Yeah. Right. Exactly. What is, what essentially it comes down to when you're looking at a breach delivery, 
because there is a slightly more risk to the baby situation you're looking at. Mm -hmm. And this is what I've learned from reading some of the materials on the Breach Without Borders website is you're looking at a risk either way. You have to choose your heart. There is Mm -hmm. a risk to a C-section to the baby. Mm -hmm. And there is a risk in the long term to the mother. And there are risks to future babies because Mm -hmm. of the scar in the uterus. Mm -hmm. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah. And unless you have anything to share about that, but I, yeah, I actually, I did want to tag on to that a little bit because this was something not for breach, but for uterine rupture with having hysterotomy extensions that I had to make that same decision, right? I had to go through that same conversation, I guess we could say with doctors and midwives and stuff is that people will throw statistics at you and they'll say things like there's a 0.4% or a 0.6% or this study has 3% or this study is 6%. And all these numbers that I'm citing right now are numbers that I have read and received in response to uterine rupture for for women that have had previous C-sections and specifically hysterotomy extensions, you know, could hire that, heighten that risk a little bit more. Yeah. But what ends up happening when people give you those statistics is they say things like that to you. They'll say there could be a chance, uh, you know, a 0.6% chance you'll have a uterine rupture. But what I hear when people say that is, oh, so there's a 99.4% chance that I won't have a uterine rupture. Yeah. And then the other thing that they don't say is, okay, so there is a 0.4 to potentially 6% chance I could have a uterine rupture, but what are the chances of other complications if I were to have a repeat C-section? Yeah. And there was a specific post I kept looking for. And actually it looks like, I think it was from VBAC Academy. I'm going to open the picture because this text got messed up. Okay. But VBAC Academy, they shared about how VBAC, having a VBAC is actually safer than having a repeat cesarean because there is a the risks are higher of, of other complications that are associated with it. Mm. And to me, this, this specific chart I'm looking at doesn't, it's not the one I was looking for because the one that I was looking for talked about your chances of, um, shoot, what is it called when that happened to me? And I don't know why I don't remember it. When you lose a ton of blood hemorrhage, hemorrhage. Hemorrhage, Yes. The risk of hemorrhage is so much it, it's so high for a repeat cesarean or for any cesarean and that was one of the ones that stuck out to me because i was like yeah then that ha- i had a c-section and that happened to me yeah um because it, it's just not natural to take a baby out that way but it talks about the risk of a hysterectomy is 0.42 percent in a repeat cesarean 4.2 percent so let's say that the chance of a uterine rupture is 0.4%, <laughs> then that means your chances of having a hysterectomy because of the repeat C-section is higher than the chance of a uterine rupture if you're having a VBAC, which I find very interesting. Yeah. Um, this study cites 0.4 to 1% chance of a uterine rupture for a VBAC. And the risk of a hysterectomy if you have a VBAC is 0.23%. So it's half of the chance of having a hysterectomy if you end up having a VBAC, because I'm sure that that, that's accounting for the people that didn't go so well. Risk of a blood transfusion is 1.53%. One in 65 women that have a repeat cesarean will have a blood transfusion. Mm -hmm. A blood transfusion is one in 53 for a repeat, for a vaginal birth, for a VBAC. Maternal death for a repeat C-section is 9.6 per 100,000. And for VBACs, it's 1.9 per 100,000. Wow. So there's an eight time more likely chance. So you tell me which one is more dangerous, you know? 
And I'm not trying right. to sway anybody any sort of way. It's just to say that there are, like you said, there's risks with everything. This is all yes. about the more, you know, the more you understand, the more you understand how the body works. And I think you and I both went through some cool stuff together, learning a little bit more about breach when I was planning this home birth and everything. And that there are a couple of different variations of breach. There's Frank breach, which is when their little butts come out first. Yeah. <laughs> then there's footling breach, which is where a foot comes out first. And then there's complete breach, which is kind of similar to Frank that they're it's their butt first, but their legs are in a different position. Mm -hmm. And really the only, um, position that you really are going to need some medical professional help with is transverse, which is right. Where they're sideways. sideways. Yeah. Cause a baby can't come out sideways, you know, with their arm. Yeah. Um, so anyway, this is all to say, we wanted to share this knowledge with you. And I know I, I, Rachel, I really appreciate you sharing all of this. Cause I know it's not easy to share. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, you know, I appreciate you hearing my story and anyone else who's listening it's um you know it's it's been a long time and so I have processed things differently and I think part of the healing for me processing was the education and mm -hmm. so this is why I do feel I feel passionate about helping other mothers or fathers or anyone in general to feel empowered to be educated because it's only through us understanding the education and the statistics that we are truly giving informed consent. And like, I think that the, the common thread in my story should be is that I was not given informed consent of what was going to be happening to my body we all should have the rights to make decisions for our our babies and our births and the unfortunately the medical field is not always going to advocate for our our informedness mm -hmm. we got to do that ourselves so that's mm -hmm. what i hope that anyone takes away from this is go out and research this stuff for yourself because yeah. i you got to do it before it happens to you is hear other this is why birth stories are important mm -hmm. is hear what happened to someone else and and learn from it because I want other people to have better experiences than me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I have an idea. Go to the radiant miss, the radiant mission Instagram and look at who I follow and then follow those people because I follow, I told somebody today, I watch approximately 20 babies being born on Instagram per day. And they're like, <laughs> what? But I feel like I really do because I follow so many birth accounts yeah. that are all midwives or doulas or VBAC type of accounts. Because I was even that research when I was having been that that's my feed now, you know, that's yeah. my life is watching babies yeah. be born, which I love. So yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing this Ray. I, I say close this out. Um, yeah. Well, how do you usually do this? <laughs> <laughs> You have your whole spiel about follow here. along with the mission. <laughs> There's a pod that we're on a podcast right now. We got a YouTube channel. We got an email address somewhere. I think we got a website. <laughs> follow us on Instagram at the radiant mission. Um, that's good enough. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not as good at remembering spiels like you, but what I, I, I do have a note of is closing us today with a Bible verse. Like we usually do. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Hebrews 10, 23. Love that. Thank you for listening. And we wish you all a radiant week. Thank you.